Now we're going to look at science now and continue uh, with it after some lectures on Descartes and his followers. But for tonight, I want now to turn to the development of modern science, and I'd like you to look at both the good and the bad elements in this philosophy, in the philosophy of modern science as it develops. It was, of course, science, the great achievement of this period, and the most influential philosophical. Let's look at a few of the key figures and spokesmen for the new science. Copernicus, 1474 to 1543. Now we've talked about opening up the world, and this is the key to the times. If the Kennedy administration hadn't taken it over, I would say the slogan of the Renaissance is new frontiers. <laughs> Invention unlocks the secrets of nature. Exploration unlocks the surface of the earth. Research unlocks antiquity. Well, Copernicus unlocked the astronomical universe. You know the old geocentric view of the earth at the center and the hollow spheres inside each other with the heavenly bodies implanted in them revolving around. That was Aristotle's view. Copernicus did not invent the heliocentric view, the view that the sun is at the center. That was known in antiquity. But he made it popular. Uh, that the sun is at the center of the solar system and the earth revolved around it. This thought led in others, Giordano Bruno as an example, to the view that there was nothing specially privileged about man's solar system, that there was an endless number of such systems, and that the universe was an infinite collection of bodies, that space was infinite and the earth in effect counted for very little in the cosmic scheme of things. Now, the significance of this was that man no longer had a metaphysically privileged place in the universe. The earth was no longer the center of the universe. The protective crystalline spheres were shattered, and an open, endless physical universe awaited discovery. Now, there are commentators who say this had the effect of man's unimportance. Not true. Man had discovered it. It was a triumph of the human intellect. But what it did have an effect on this heliocentric view was religion, the Bible story of creation, the view that this earth was a stage setting for the enactment of God's drama and that God spent his time watching the proceedings. This view never recovered from the Copernican revolution. If it's an endless universe with endless worlds, God, people began to think, just simply hasn't got the time to sit around watching some species on a remote planet lost in infinite space. Now, the Copernican revolution in that sense was an astronomical knife in the back to religion. The only other comparable one was Darwin in the 19th century. Now, I hasten to add, you cannot refute religion on scientific grounds. Religion is a philosophic issue, and Copernicus does not refute the existence of God. It's the way was open immediately for religious people to incorporate Copernicus and say, God is infinite, so he can watch Adam and Eve on infinite number of planets. And therefore, uh, the fact that Earth is just one tiny speck in the universe doesn't mean he isn't interested. All that uh, Copernicus really affected was the literal fundamentalists who interpreted the scriptures literally. And that, of course, is inessential to uh, philosophy but it did have a serious setting back effect of religion for the reasons I mentioned. Now, I might mention Tycho Brahe, B-R-A-H-E, 1546 to 1601, who made a host of observations and measurements of an astronomical nature. William Gilbert, 1544 to 1603, who inaugurated the scientific study of magnetism. And now let's take a look at uh, Johann Kepler, 1571 to 1630, K-E-P-L-E-R. Kepler discovered the laws of planetary motion, building on Tycho Brahe's data. He discovered that the planets move around the sun in ellipses, which was an enormous shock, because the Greeks had always said the circle is the perfect figure. And when they found that the planets don't go in circles, they go in ellipses, everybody was staggered. 
And that was an enormous impetus to observation and a scientific study of the world because the idea was think what you can learn by actually studying the facts. <laughs> Moreover, Copernicus discovered that the speed with which the planets move can be calculated mathematically according to certain simple laws that govern all the planets. Wherever he learned, he saw mathematical relationships of the most surprising kind. Mathematical relationships. For instance, the planets were known to speed up and slow down in their courses around the sun. And the question was how to find any regularity in their changes of velocity. Now, if the medieval world had known about it, they would have looked for an answer on this order. Well, when it's hot, they go faster. When it's cold, they go slower. When it's dark, they go faster. When it's light, they go slower. When it's etc. If they had tried at all to explain it and not just say God willed it. Copernic, uh, Kepler rather, found a mathematical law dealing with numbers and geometrical figures. He found that if you draw a line from the focus of the ellipse, the point, you know, where the sun is, to the orbit of the planet, and another line to another point on the orbit. You'll have a triangle. And do the same with another two points, you'll get another triangle. And he found that if the two triangles are equal in area, then the times required for the planet to go from the first point to the second are the same. In other words, equal areas are swept out in equal times. Now this was absolutely unsuspected. Imagine the planets function according to geometrical figures. Their speed is a function of the area that they sweep out. Or again, he discovered every planet takes a certain amount of time to, dis to circle the sun. Call it T in appropriate units. And it has an average distance from the sun. Call it D. Well, for each planet, you'll get two different numbers. Now he worked it out and he found out that it invariably is the case that t squared equals d cubed. If you multiply the time by itself and the distance by itself by itself, you get the, the uh, equality. Now, you must not underestimate or overestimate, you, I mean underestimate, the utter shock of this discovery that simple numerical geometrical relationships govern the laws of nature. This was absolutely unexpected, and yet it took place. You'll see what happens to it in a moment. And in that sense, Kepler is enormously important to the development of science and philosophy because of discovering the first crucial mathematical laws. Now let's look at Francis Bacon. 1561 to 1626, the one who did not write Shakespeare's works. <laughs> he is uh, not so much a scientist as a philosopher of science. He's one of the first spokesmen for the new science. And as such, he's not an originator, but a very eloquent formulator of many of the ideas that were uh, germinating in the scientific world. Here are some of his key ideas. One famous line of his, knowledge is power. Now, this is an attitude that he did not originate, but the attitude that it expresses is a new phenomenon in the Western world. It is in contrast to the medieval world and in contrast to the ancient world, even Aristotle. Remember, even Aristotle had held that scientific knowledge is an end in itself. You contemplate simply for the satisfaction of your curiosity. Bacon expresses the attitude of the Renaissance. Knowledge is not an end in itself, it is power. If you have enough knowledge of the laws of nature, you can remake the world to serve human purposes. Nature is not something to be gazed at passively, but something to be used and exploited to satisfy human goals. Man becomes an active creature rather than simply a passive, tranquil observer. Now this is an indispensable contribution of the Renaissance to human thought. Without it, of course, the Industrial Revolution would have been impossible. By itself, it's not enough. You also needed political freedom for the Industrial Revolution, but this attitude that knowledge is power 
is a mark of the modern mind, not of the ancient or medieval. And of course, as a consequence, Bacon held, and so did the people of this period, that if we study nature, we can make limitless progress. There's endless new vistas to discover and new things to invent and new improvements to make in human life. Now again, this contrasts radically, not only with the medieval, but with the Greek view. Both Plato and Aristotle had the idea, being at the very beginning of knowledge, that everything essentially was known, that perfection, so far as man could achieve it, was reached, and that there was no more progress, simply a static remaining at the level already attained. The idea of permanent progress in uh, human development is a Renaissance contribution. And now another crucial idea of Bacon's. Nature to be commanded must be obeyed. If you want to achieve your goals and get what you want from nature, you must understand its laws and obey them. There's no use praying or trying to get around nature. If you want to produce a certain effect, you have to know the cause. If you want to remove a certain effect, you have to know what cause to eliminate. A very, very pregnant, crucial aphorism. Nature to be commanded must be obeyed. One of the best aphorisms in the entire history of thought. We must, therefore, says Bacon, have the right methodology. We must have the right means of acquiring knowledge. We must know how to learn. Now, this is, again, a typically modern attitude. Ancient and medieval philosophy, although they have a great deal to say on epistemology, are dominantly centered on metaphysics as the crucial branch of philosophy. Modern philosophy centers on epistemology as the dominant branch of philosophy. All modern philosophers, with a few exceptions, are highly conscious of the theory of knowledge. They're highly conscious that before you go into what is the universe like, you have to first validate your method of knowing it. And therefore, progressively, epistemology comes to dominate the sea. Uh, to the point, of course, of insanity in the form it takes in 20th century movements where metaphysics is thrown out altogether and philosophy is exclusively epistemology. But this emphasis on epistemology goes all the way back to the Renaissance. Now again, I stress the Greeks, of course, were interested in epistemology, but they were not centered on epistemology the way everybody was from the time of the Renaissance, or most people. Now, as to Bacon's epistemology, he says we have to break clean from all the errors of the past. And he could quote the Bible here, except as ye become as little children, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. But we have to become like little children epistemologic. Almost everything he says that we believe is wrong. We are right and left seduced by prejudices, superstitions, faulty methods of thinking, which plunge us into fallacies of all kinds. And he proceeded to define four categories of errors that we have to get rid of, which he called the four idols. Now, this is presented in any elementary text on the history of philosophy, so I'll zip through it in a minute. There's the idols of the tribe. Those are the ones, the fallacies, which he believed are inherent in human nature as such. That is, they derive from you belonging to the tribe of mankind. For instance, the tendency to treat abstractions as things, to talk about, to give modern examples in all these cases, not necessarily Bacon's, to talk about the state or society or Washington as though it was an entity. Or the tendency to reject evidence that doesn't conform to your particular pet viewpoint and to look only for supporting evidence, and thus to engage in hasty generalizations. Or Bacon himself lists as one fallacy, one idol of the tribe, the deceptiveness of the senses, the tendency of human beings to rely on the senses, which he believes deceive us via illusions. Of course, he believes that if we correct them by instruments and experiments, they're okay. But you see, this is already a crack in the door at the outset. Here's the philosopher of science, ambivalent about the validity of the senses. Then there are the idols of the cave. 
Those are the fallacies deriving from the peculiar mental or physical constitution of each individual. Uh, each person uh, lives in a cave of his own, you see, with his own personal distortions over and above the ones that come from being a member of the human race. For instance, the tendency to interpret everything from the viewpoint of your own particular specialty. So a uh, physicist, for instance, will characteristically say there is no such thing as mind. All that exists is the laws of mechanics. A mathematician will say ethics isn't a science because you can't quantify it, etc. Or the tendency of some people to be conservative in a very broad sense here. Everything new is no good. As opposed to other people to be, quote, progressive. Everything old is no good. That would be an idol of the cave. Then there's the idols of the marketplace. Those are the idol, the fallacies that derive from the association of men with one another. And that means primarily from language, which is the medium of association. So that, for instance, because words exist, says Bacon, we think that things corresponding to those words must exist. People talk about fate, destiny, chance, fortune. And because they use those words, they think there are such things. That's an idol of the marketplace. And of course, there are ambiguous and vague words which get people into trouble. I don't need to give you an example. And finally, there are the idols of the theater. And these are the false ideas that have resulted from unsound systems of philosophy which have been widely accepted. He calls them idols of the theater because he regards previous philosophies as, quote, stage plays representing worlds of their author's creation, unquote. In other words, he's being sarcastic about all previous philosophy. And here he launches an all-out attack against previous philosophy, theology, intellectual tradition of all kinds. He is particularly virulent in his attack on Aristotle. In part, it is the very package deal that we already observed. Aristotle is the scholastic, you see, allegedly. In part, Bacon is opposed to the syllogism. It doesn't give you new knowledge. All it does is apply what we already know. All men are mortal, therefore Socrates is. Now, I've uh, covered that in a question period, so I won't present it further here. We need, says Bacon, a new method of arriving at knowledge, not a worthless method like the syllogism, which does nothing but tell us in our conclusion what we already knew in the premise anyway. Aristotle's logic came, had come to be called the organon, which means the instrument. Well, Bacon wrote one called the novum organum, the new instrument. And the new method that we have to use, he says, is not syllogism, but induction. We have to observe and generalize to arrive at laws. This is the way to acquire knowledge, not deduction or syllogism. Now, I interject here. Aristotle, of course, recognized induction way before Bacon. He was the one who defined it for the first time. Moreover, Bacon uses a syllogism to refute the syllogism. His argument is, everything that doesn't teach you something new in his sense is worthless. The syllogism doesn't teach you something new, and therefore it's worthless. That's a syllogism. Does he learn something new from it or not? He's using the syllogism to attack it, as all the opponents of the syllogism do. What I will say, however, is that Bacon made great improvements in the method and type of induction that had been used prior to his time. Again, I don't believe that he originated this, but he is the formidable spokesman for a new theory of induction. In a word, what came to be called experimental induction. Now, the Greek method was called induction by simple enumeration. And that means induction simply by enumerating examples. You see, this man die, this man die, this man die, this man die, and after a while you generalize and say all men are mortal and so on. Now this was really simple enumeration, was really the only method of induction known to Aristotle and the ancient world. And it has great problems. You might strike coincidences. This Chinese man is a laundryman, and this one is, and this one is, therefore all Chinamen are laundrymen. You see. And there may be exceptions to your general rule, qualifying conditions that make it less than universal. This crow is black, and this one is, and this one is, but there may be an albino crow. 
And above all, simple enumeration leaves man passive. He simply has to sit around and wait for the instances to trot before his eyes. Now, the modern method of induction, of which Bacon is one of the early formulators, is not by simple enumeration, but by experimentation. Suppose you want to establish the value of a certain drug. Now, if you go simply by enumeration, you never can get very far because there's too many factors operating, and you don't know what is really responsible. Suppose you observe a thousand people take the drug, and they get better. Now, was that due to the drug? Or is they have some dietary factor in common? Or is it they belong to a certain race? Or was it a normal process where the disease would heal itself no matter what? Or what? But the modern method is control of variables. Divide the, your subjects up into two groups. Match them factor for factor. Everything that might conceivably be relevant to the effect you're investigating. And then give the drug to one group and not to the others. Presumably you do it with rats and not with people in this case. And then perhaps on the basis of maybe just 25 or 50 exa examples, if you've chosen your subjects appropriately, you can establish a causal connection and generalize a universal principle with a degree of certainty that you cannot approach if you simply follow 10,000 crows around and observe, yes, this is black and this is black and this is black, but what about the next one? The method of controlled experiments, of subjecting all relevant factors to, to human control, and then systematically altering the one factor you're interested in to see what effects that will have. That was the method of experimentation. And it really is indispensable to any sound inductive method. It's not the whole story, but it's an important ingredient. And Bacon was one of the first formulators of this method. And you see again, the emphasis on human activity. Just as knowledge is power, and therefore the goal of science is to go out and act and do something, so in method, man should go out and do something with the factors. Control them, alter them, experiment. Not simply wait passively for the instances to confront him. So again, that common denominator, the Man as an active being, in goal and in method, is a Renaissance contribution. Now notice that Bacon is still an empiricist. All knowledge rests on sensory observation and induction therefrom. There are no innate ideas, he agrees with Aristotle. The world is lawful, reason can know the world, the world is worth knowing, all that is Aristotle. In that sense, Bacon is fundamentally Aristotelian. But his antagonism to deduction and his ambivalence on the senses is already a crack in the wall. Now let's look at Galileo. We're already now approaching into the 17th century, 1564 to 1642. Now in a way, Galileo was the real founder of modern science. And of course, Isaac Newton was born the year that Galileo died, and between them, modern science reached its maturity. Galileo discovered certain basic laws of motion governing all material bodies in the universe. One of them, of course, was the law of falling bodies. That all bodies, no matter of what size or weight, fall with the same acceleration. Whether you drop a feather or a rock, they fall with the same acceleration in a vacuum, of course. And this is mathematically measurable. It's 32 feet per second per second. And, of course, he discovered much more than this, but that's simply a sample. Now, what became clear to Galileo before it became fully clear to anybody else was the crucial value of mathematics to science. That, of course, was in part prepared for by Kepler and others, but Galileo is the one who really gets the credit for it. He, more than anyone else, is the one who grasped that physics requires mathematics if it is to develop. Prior to this time, physics and mathematics were regarded essentially as two separate subjects. Approximately the way today you regard aesthetics and chemistry, 
that you take one from one professor and one from another on different days, and they have your most tenuous, if any, connection. But an aesthetic chemistry or a chemical aesthetics, you simply wouldn't get. Well, that was the attitude of mathematics in relation to physics until Galileo. Galileo was the man who created the concept of mathematical physics. And in that sense, is the father of modern science. What was the value of mathematics? Well, they observed that mathematics gave you an exactness that you couldn't get otherwise. If you simply say something is long or hot or fast, you can't do very much with that knowledge. But if you say it's 10.2 feet or 93.7 degrees or it's moving at a rate of 32 feet per second, if you translate a quality into a quantity, you have a precision in your knowledge of nature that is otherwise unattainable. And as a result, you can discover relationships in reality that you could never hope to discover on a qualitative basis. You could see things getting faster, but only if you exactly measure could you discover that acceleration under gravity is uniform. You can discover a law unexpected on the basis of observation, a precise mathematical law. And it turned out that these laws existed and were being discovered by scientists in all sorts of areas. As some of them put it, it they all believed in God, of course, it's as if God were a mathematician and he had built the universe on mathematical lines. And of course, because precise laws had been discovered, combinations of them suggested still wider laws, which would explain the earlier ones. And on the basis of a handful of mathematically formulated laws, Newton explained almost all phenomena in physics and astronomy then known. The discoveries of Kepler, Galileo, uh, etc. It appeared to them that if you tried to unravel the universe strictly in qualitative terms, you were limited to a few vague generalizations, like Aristotle with his earth, air, water, and fire. But if you approached it quantitatively, the whole universe opened up to human understanding. And as a result of this pre uh, precision, exact predictions could be made, and therefore, Knowledge became power. Control over the world could be exerted in a way that would be unapproachable without mathematics. So that on the basis of Newton's discoveries, for instance, you could predict to the last fraction of a second when the apple would fall, how fast, where it would be each second, when the tides would rise and fall, how high, how fast, how the planets revolved, the path of the comets, the behavior of gases, everything then no. Galileo and some established that the true task of physics is to discover the mathematical relationships governing bodies in motion. And this was as fruitful an approach as could be dreamed of. Now here we have to give credit to Pythagoras. You remember him with his mystical world of numbers. Well, many of these scientists were Pythagoreans. And they looked for mathematical law even in the face of the belief that of everybody else that it's hopeless and you'll never find it. They looked on the grounds that Pythagoras had said all things are numbers and if we look long enough we'll simply have to find the numbers. Now for instance Kepler was a Pythagorean. A really weird Pythagorean. Remember the Pythagoreans in the ancient world had believed that music was mathematical. And since everything was mathematical, they believed that the heavenly bodies gave out music, the music of the spheres. They associated music and the heavens because both were mathematical. Well, Kepler goes so far as to identify the vocal range of each planet. Jupiter is a bass, for instance, Mars a tenor, Venus a soprano, Mercury a falsetto, and the Earth sings me, fa, me. For Misery, famine, misery. Now you see the fantastic combination of errant mysticism and modern science. It's not a clean break by any means with mysticism. But we must say for the record that Pythagoras, in spite of all of his mysticism, finally bore serious fruit. 
Well, now let us take a look at the universe established by the scientists, including now Newton, and contrasted with the medieval viewpoint. To begin with, modern science despiritualized nature. Despiritualized nature. Science declared that physical nature was nothing but the movement of small bodies, of atoms, of which one movement is the cause of the other, operating according to simple, inexorable mathematical laws. There was no room left for spiritual powers of any kind, for supernatural powers, for occult powers to operate. And here, of course, they used Occam's razor. Entities are not to be multiplied beyond necessity. I can explain, the scientists said, the whole world strictly on the basis of matter in motion. Therefore, let's wipe out all spiritual entities in physical nature. Away with angels, devils, gods, world souls, essences, the whole works are out. As a result, of course, teleology was rejected. Mechanism was adopted. Teleology, as you know, is the view that everything is purposive. Everything aims or strives for some goal. And it does imply the idea of some kind of consciousness controlling things, even though many of its advocates have denied that. But in actual fact, as I mentioned in an earlier lecture, you cannot talk about striving for the future unless you have the faculty of awareness of the future. And in that sense, teleology does imply consciousness. And uh, when they despiritualized the physical world, they abandoned teleology in favor of mechanism. The rallying cry was, there are no final causes in nature, only efficient causes. And again, in contrast to the Greeks and the medievals, they held the view of modern science that the whole universe is homogeneous. Now, the Greeks and the medievals had tended to exalt the astronomical universe, the heavens, and to say that the part on earth was of a lesser material, lesser in value, or different in kind. Even Aristotle held that view. Modern science said no. The universe is homogeneous throughout. The laws which apply to the heavens and the material which exists in the heavens is the same as the material and the laws on earth which, of course, is our modern perspective. Now, you see here, of course, that it is the mechanistic, atomistic materialism of Democritus that won out and became the philosophy of modern science. And these people were all influenced by the ancient atomists. Now, I just point out to you that some of them, particularly in the philosophers, not the scientists, tended to generalize. And they said, why should the animals, why should man be an exception to the principles that govern the entire physical universe? Man, too, must be simply matter in motion, and that's all. There's no distinction in principle between the animate and the inanimate. Mind can be explained materialistically and mechanistically, simply as a kind of motion of material bodies according to mathematical law. That's the position that we'll see Thomas Hobbes takes next week. If you want to take an overview, therefore, you can say that modern science has four main roots, three of them traceable back to the ancient world. One, its basic philosophy in epistemology, metaphysics, and ethics is Aristotelian. The senses, reason, denial of innate ideas, this world is fully real, intelligible to man, worth studying, the proper processes are induction and deduction. Human life on Earth is a value. All of those premises, which are indispensable to modern science, are Aristotelian. In that sense, modern science is Aristotelian at its philosophic base. But in specific content, the next main contributor was Democritus, because modern science adopted mechanistic materialism for its theory of nature. And this they needed fully to implement Aristotle's metaphysics. Aristotle had implied that the whole world was lawful, but his teleology, remember, had led him to, ch to the idea of chance and that some things violate law. Mechanistic materialism, as applied now strictly to the physical world, I make no comment about man or living creatures, but as applied strictly to the inanimate world, 
was needed in order fully to implement the idea that the universe is lawful. And thirdly, Pythagoras, because Pythagoras combined with Democritus was the key factor in being able to grasp the laws that mechanistic materialism told us existed because Pythagoras supplied the idea that the key to law is mathematics. The fourth root is the distinctive Renaissance contribution that I've stressed. Man as an active being, that supplied both the inductive methodology of experimentation and the goal, knowledge is power. Uh, so you can say that, to summarize it, on an Aristotelian base, the idea of combining Democritus and Pythagoras on the premise that man must act, that combination gave rise to modern science. Now I have referred to the good and the bad in modern science. I've given you some warning signs of the bad in Bacon. By the way, Galileo did not share Bacon's contempt for deduction. But I now want to look at one crucial premise of Galileo which was instrumental in undercutting modern science and affecting the subsequent transition back to Platonism, skepticism, and ultimately Kant. Galileo declares that a crucial distinction can be made between two kinds of sensory qualities. On the one hand, colors, tastes, smells, sounds, hot and cold, textures, etc. On the other, size, shape, number, motion, rest. Now, who does this remind you of? Democritus? Democritus is a distinction between the qualities the atoms have in themselves and the subjective qualities they simply appear to have because of their effects on us. Galileo took this distinction over from Democritus and embedded it into the heart of modern science so that it became scientific orthodoxy thereafter. And therefore, this distinction was accepted by Descartes, it was accepted by Hobbes, it was accepted by Spinoza, it was accepted by Locke, and it was Locke who gave it its modern name, the so-called primary qualities versus the secondary qualities, the primary being the uh, shape, size, uh, number, motion or rest, the secondary being all the rest. What is the difference between them? Well, they said, the primary are mathematically measurable. They are quantifiable. You can give us a precise mathematical description of the shape of something, or the size, or its rate of motion. But can you tell us how beige something is, or how cherry it tastes, or how rosy it smells, etc.? Well, they said no. Now, if reality is, as Pythagoras said, the place that is par excellence mathematicizable, then the qualities that can't be quantified are not real. That was one argument. And then, of course, they argue. The so-called secondary qualities vary from person to person, from perceiver to perceiver. The colorblind man sees gray and the normal man sees red. The man with the cold in his nose tastes cherry pie as bitter versus the man without a cold, etc. On the other hand, the primary qualities remain the same for everybody. You can measure them. And therefore, if it's six inches, it's six inches. Whether you've got a cold in your nose or a color blind or are standing on your head. And therefore, they argued on that ground also, it looks like the secondary qualities are perceiver dependent, dependent on the perceiver and simply subjective, whereas the primary qualities are not. And then again, thirdly, they argue, it's quite easy to conceive of matter without these secondary qualities. Think of air, for instance. It doesn't bother you at all that it has no color, it has no sound. In most cases, it has no detectable temperature. In fact, for a long time, men didn't even know it existed. 
On the other hand, if you try to take away one of your primary qualities, the whole thing obliterates in your mind and there's nothing left. Try and imagine a piece of matter of any kind that has no size at all, no shape, no number, is neither moving nor at rest, and of course it obliterates. And so they said this is further confirmation of the fact that the primary qualities are intrinsic in reality. The secondary qualities are just our subjective human way of perceiving what's out there in uh, reality. Colors, sounds, tastes, smells, textures, warmth, cold, all of these, they said, do not exist in reality. They are merely subjective effects in us of what is really out there. And a common example uh, later given was, it's like the tickle of a feather. When you tickle somebody with a feather, where is the tickle? Is the tickle out there in the feather, or is the tickle just the effect on you? Well, obviously, the tickle is just the effect on you. If there was no you, there'd be no tickle. Well, they said exactly that holds true for all of the secondary qualities. And for the same reasons. How do you know the tickle isn't there? Well, it's not mathematically measurable. I'm presenting their view. It varies from person to person. Some people giggle and others don't. And you could easily imagine matter which is not ticklish. But uh, uh, you can't do that with the primary qualities. Consequently, concluded Galileo and his followers, the senses are deceptive. The world is not what it looks like at all. The world of science is a strange, remote world of mute, colorless, textureless, odorless particles having only size, shape, and motion. All the rest is a subjective illusion. Now, as I say, just about everybody picked this up. It is a dichotomy which has had catastrophic effects. It's Democritus's view, of course. And it leads to people like Bertrand Russell saying there are two tables in this room. The table of common sense, which is green and solid and peaceful and so on. And the table of science, which is a berserk mass of charges whirling back and forth and shooting off cosmic rays and so on. And Bertrand Russell spent a good part of his life trying to get the two tables back together into one table and finally confessed that it couldn't be done, at least in certain moods he thought it couldn't be done. <laughs> now this is a vital issue uh, and you will soon see the catastrophes that derive from this primary secondary quality distinction. Now, in the brief remaining time, let us go back for a while in time and see what is happening in the value realms of philosophy and ethics and politics. Now, I said that there were the Platonists and the scientists. What effect did the uh, new science have on value theory? Let's look at the new science first, and then we'll see what the Platonists were up to in value theory. Well, let's take as our example of an early political theorist claiming to speak as a scientist, Machiavelli, 1469-1527. Now, he was one of the earliest to develop what is called the modern scientific attitude to values. And that came about as follows. Science consists of observing the facts and then explaining them. In science, you don't say what you would like the facts to be. You simply record the way they are. The purpose of science is description, not prescription. Well, how do you apply that to ethics and politics? Well, said the so-called moralists of science, we are not going to tell men what they ought to do. Ethics consists of simply describing what people actually do do. Good means what men want, not what they ought to want. Just as gravity is how bodies act, not how they ought to act. This came to be known as the naturalistic or realistic view of ethics. 
as opposed to see to the idealistic view that ethics has something to do with values. Their argument again was any science has to be, including ethics, has to be concerned with facts, not with values. Values do not come under the domain of facts. There are no values out there in the world intrinsically, as an intrinsic inherent feature of things. Nothing is good in itself, they argued. It is good only to someone, which means it is good only if somebody arbitrarily decides it's good, which means it is good only subjective and therefore outside the bounds of science. Now here you see the dichotomy. Values are either out there in the world as independent entities, that is to say they're intrinsic, or they are simply arbitrary human constructs, that is to say they are subjective. Uh, those influenced by science on this question decided to take the view that values are subject, and that their sole function is to describe the values people actually hold without comment. Those influenced by Plato took the view, of course, that values are intrinsic. They're part of the furniture of the universe. So you reduce back to Plato versus the sophists. Intrinsic mystical values versus subjective uh, uh, values. And modern science firmly aligned itself with the subjective viewpoint. And you, today it's a bromide. Science has nothing to say about values. Science gives us means, it doesn't give us ends, etc. Now, the idea of a third possibility, that values are objective, neither intrinsic in reality, nor subjective arbitrary constructions of human beings, was never dreamed of at all prior to objectivism. I cannot elaborate that in this course, but if you read Ayn Rand's essay, Capitalism, The Unknown Ideal, the title essay, on what is capitalism, the first essay, uh, will elaborate the objectivist view on this question. In any event, Machiavelli, I think I gave you his dates 1469 to 1527, combined this so-called realist approach with a strong dose of secularized original sin. Men in his viewpoint are essentially stupid, irrational creatures, incapable of self-government or rational control of themselves. They are moved by passion, not reason. Therefore, the only feasible government is a strong monarchy. Same type of argument that Plato gave, that Augustine gave, and that Hobbes is going to give next week. If we don't have a powerful government, we'll have universal slaughter, says Machiavelli. Now, the king will probably turn out to be a tyrant, since he also is a man, but what can you do when you deal with people? Now you say, well, why don't you tell people how they ought to behave? Why don't you set standards of good and evil to which the ruler should adhere? And Machiavelli would answer, now look, I don't set standards, I'm a scientist. Whatever men aim at is the good, by definition. And whatever acts produce this end is virtue, by definition. If men want power, then the acts which produce power are virtue. And they do want power. Everybody wants power. That's the way people are. There's no art about it. Politics is therefore the art of developing those qualities which will enable you to achieve power. And the ones that will do it best, says Machiavelli, are force and fraud. Therefore, if you employ them ruthlessly enough and cunningly enough, you will achieve your ends. And in his manual, The Prince, he gives many tips as to how to do it. This is the so-called realistic, but actually, as you see, completely subjectivist approach. What was the alternative that was offered? You see, just to summarize this point, once they abandoned teleology, the idea that reality sets certain purposes to man, they could think of no objective way to prescribe a code of values. And so they drew the conclusion, you simply take men as they factually come, observe their desires without comment, and simply describe for them the best way of achieving their ends, whatever those ends happen to be. Now, as against this trend, 
The other trend of the Renaissance was the Platonists, who believed that values are intrinsic, that there's a form of the good or some equivalent out there in reality, and all you have to do is commune with it and you'll know what's really good. They preach ideals based on intrinsic goodness. And in a funny uh, little coincidence, every single one of them preaches that the ideal is a socialist or communist state uh, politically. And here the arch example is Thomas More, 1480 to 1535, author of Utopia, one of the fathers of socialism in which he advocates a complete communist state. Uh, if you're interested in asking the question period, I brought a book which describes some of the features of Utopia, but I won't take the time to read it now. You see, however, the alternative you're offered. Notice that both sides recommend force. Moore says, we must have rule by the learned, because most men can't grasp the intrinsic good by themselves. Therefore, they have to be compelled. That's pure Platonism, you see, the philosopher king, in effect. Machiavelli says there is no intrinsic good. Therefore, he concludes there's no rational way of dealing with men. Therefore, we must use force. So we're back again to Plato versus the sophists. You see the crucial need for an objective code of morality, which will be neither intrinsic nor subjective. And that was, of course, one of the major ethical contributions of objectivism. As it came to be put during this period, the crucial need is to find a place for value in a world of fact. How to find room for objective values in a world of fact. And the consensus of philosophy progressively was it cannot be done. Either you have a mystic experience or a religious ethics or you become a Machiavellian skeptic. Well, you see now the problems beginning to emerge as we reach the end of the 16th century. In metaphysics, God is not yet dead and the religionists have yet to make their final attempts to save him, to reconcile God and science. While the materialists are busy denying mind and purpose and saying man is simply a complicated machine. In epistemology, you see the attack on the senses, on deduction, that bodes very badly for the future. And in ethics, we are back to Plato versus the sophists. So far, however, these are all simply tendencies, suggestions. They're not yet full systems. The future course of modern philosophy awaits the 17th century when two philosophers laid down the first full modern systems of philosophy and became between them the founders of modern philosophy. One of them was the materialist Thomas Hobbes, and the other tried with all his might to reconcile science and Catholicism. And he became the real father of modern philosophy, René Descartes. Those two, Hobbes and Descartes, are the subject of next week's lecture. Until then, Let's draw a line here. Thank you. Did Aristotle's principles of definition anticipate Bacon's principles of scientific induction? I do not see the connection you imply. Certainly, for Aristotle, definitions are not simply linguistic. Uh, you're correct in his saying that for Aristotle, definitions are a mode of objective knowledge of reality, of facts of reality. Classification is an objective fact, not simply a subjective uh, declaration of how you're going to use certain vocabulary. It doesn't follow, though, that because definitions give you, according to knowledge, uh, Aristotle, objective knowledge of reality, they therefore give you the methodology of induction. Now, Aristotle himself has very little to say about the correct methodology of induction, in the extent works. All he really tells us is that there's three kinds of induction. The induction by which we arrive at axioms, like the laws of logic, which consists of seeing a few instances and then grasping self-evidently the universal truth. But that's applicable only to induction, to, to, to axioms. That's so-called intuitive induction, using intuitive meaning just the capacity to grasp the self-evident. Then there's ordinary induction, where you see three puppy dogs wag their tails, and uh, um, they're happy, and you generalize all puppy dogs wag their tails when they're happy. 
Now that type Aristotle said is suspect. All it does, that's simple enumeration, you see. All it does is give you the material for a generalization, but you have to validate it by deductive means. He did not know any methodology by which to validate it inductively, experimentally. And finally, for Aristotle, there is what's called induction by complete enumeration. That is, if in some case you could actually study every particular first under a universal, then of course you could state the generalization with complete confidence. But you wouldn't need a generalization then because you'd already know every particular. And that's all Aristotle recognizes, those three types. And therefore his theory of induction is definitely defective. Please describe utopia. All right. <laughs> I won't, but I will let, of all people, Bertrand Russell, who has a good description of it, uh, briefly. And I was going to read you this in the lecture, and I ran out of time. I'll just give you a few excerpts. This will surely be enough to give you the clue to utopia. Quote, this is Bertrand Russell's description of it, but on this point, he actually is accurate. <laughs> Quote, there are in utopia... Four, 54 towns, all on the same plan, except that one is the capital. All the streets are 20 feet broad, and all the private houses are exactly alike, with one door onto the street and one onto the garden. There are no locks on the doors, and everyone may enter any house. The roofs are flat. This is Bertrand Russell style. You know, he <laughs> throws them all in. Every tenth year, people change houses, apparently to prevent any feeling of ownership. All are dressed alike, except that there is a difference between the dress of men and women and of married and unmarried. The fashions never change, and no difference is made between summer and winter clothing. Everybody, men and women alike, works six hours a day, three before dinner and three after. All go to bed at eight and sleep eight hours. In the early morning there are lectures to which multitudes go, although they are not compulsory. After supper, an hour is devoted to play. Six hours work is enough because there are no idlers and there is no useless work. Some men are elected to become men of learning and are exempted from other work while they are found satisfactory. All who are concerned with government are chosen from the learned. See, that's pure Platonism. Family life is patriarchal. Married sons live in their father's house and are governed by him unless he is in his dotage. If any family grows too large, the surplus children are moved into another family. If a time, you see the complete collectivism. If a town grows too large, some of the inhabitants are moved into another town. If all the towns are too large, a new town is built on a wasteland. Eating at home is permitted, but most people eat in common halls. Cooking is done by women and the waiting by the older children. Men sit at one bench, women at another. Nursing mothers with children under five are in a separate parlor. You see the mentality that's got it all planned out down to the last semicom of how the rest of mankind will live its life forever. All women nurse their own children. Children over five, if too young to be waiters, stand by in marvelous silence while their elders eat. <laughs> they have no separate dinner, but must be content with such scraps as are given them from the table. As for marriage, both men and women are sharply punished, if not virgin, when they marry. And the householder of any house in which misconduct has occurred is liable to incur infamy for carelessness. Before marriage, bride and groom see each other naked. No one would buy a horse without first taking off the saddle and bridle. <laughs> and, similar and similar consideration should apply in marriage. There is divorce for adultery or intolerable waywardness of either party, but the guilty party cannot remarry. People have no money and they teach contempt for gold by using it for chamber pots <laughs> and the chains of slaves. Pearls and diamonds are used as ornaments for infants, but never for adults. One man in the book preaches Christianity to the utopians and many were converted when they learned that Christ was opposed to private property. The importance of communism is constantly stressed. Almost at the end, we are told that in all other nations, and here's a quote from Moore, I can perceive nothing but a certain conspiracy of rich men procuring their own commodities under the name and title of the commonwealth. Unquote. That sounds like McGovern, but it's Moore. 
<laughs> it goes on like that. You get the idea. It's a full-fledged platonic little uh, dictatorship. Bertrand Russell's comment on this, by the way, is that it is, quote, astonishingly liberal. <laughs> but he doesn't like it because, quote, it must be admitted, however, that life in Moore's utopia would be intolerably dull. Diversity is essential to happiness, and in utopia there is hardly any. This is a defect of all planned social systems, actual as well as imaginary, unquote. That is the totality of his comment. Then he goes on to the uh, next chapter. It's not enough diversity for him. The fact that it's a complete dictatorship and would stifle any and all human creativity he doesn't consider worth mentioning. But uh, obviously, why not? Since the metaphysical and epistemological fundamentals of modern science are heavily Aristotelian, why did modern science adopt a skeptic subjectivist ethics? Well, uh, here you have to distinguish between science qua scientists and science qua the philosophers of science. Now, the scientists, the actual working scientists, insofar as they accomplished anything, and they did accomplish marvels in the modern world, functioned as Aristotelians, regardless of what they preached. They studied the world by observation. They believed you could acquire knowledge by reason. They weren't sensualists. They weren't skeptics. They didn't try to remember their recollections of the preceding life. They weren't Platonists. They didn't search for their innate ideas. They functioned as Aristotelians. But the philosophers who were busy interpreting their works drew all kinds of Platonist and skeptic conclusions out of it. And you say, why? Well, philosophy precedes science. Science does not lead to philosophy. It's the other way around. Uh, no scientific discovery will change a philosopher's mind, nor should it, because science itself rests on a metaphysical epistemological foundation. And so all that happened is all the results of science, which rested on an implicit Aristotelian base, were systematically distorted by philosophers to justify subjectivist, skeptical, nominalist conclusions, and, of course, the proof of the power of philosophy is that the scientists themselves, not being philosophers, began to, to, to spout officially the very corrupt ideas that they were taught by philosophers. And, of course, you cannot permanently insulate science from philosophy, the actual practice of science. The result is, in the 19th, but particularly in the 20th century, Scientists in their actual working lives began to be irrationalists, began to be skeptics, began to be subjectivists and nominalists, and what you see today is the actual collapse. I don't mean just of psychology, which never got started uh, before it collapsed. I mean of biology, I mean of physics, I mean of mathematics, the actual hardcore science. Now, that process is the signs of that are all over the place. In uh, the theories of modern mathematicians, 99 of 100 of whom are uh, uh, followers of the nominalism, uh, if they, even if they've never heard the name, of every kind of subjectivism, Bertrand Russell and the whole crew, uh, it dominates the field of mathematics entirely. Uh, physics, of course, is being overrun with irrationalism. There's the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. There's quantum mechanics itself with the fantastic ideas uh, denying the law of cause and effect, uh, uh, claiming some of them that uh, subatomic particles are and are not corpuscular at the same time in respect to that this refutes the law of contradiction. There's the fantastic interpretations placed on Einstein's theory of relativity. Uh, oh, well, there's no use, uh, that's a whole course in itself. Uh, there's this theory in biology that molecules have memory. Uh, I mean, you can't uh, keep science separate indefinitely. At the beginning, riding on an Aristotelian remnant, it was able to accomplish marvelous things, but that's only for so long. 